thank you so much. I'm now going to turn it over to this amazing panel. Thank you, Donna. Welcome, everyone, and thank you so much for that introduction. Just going to turn around a little bit here. Um, <clears throat> we want to thank educators in VR for including us in the Universe Virtual Experience Conference. And I welcome you to a group of panelists that have been working in vir virtual environments for many years. And all of us here today talking with you realize that together we can identify the best purposes and practices for both headset VR and desktop virtual reality. So we want you to walk away today feeling that you're not alone in your exploration of VR for education. So we're going to conduct our panel in a, a group of rounds today, a couple of rounds. And um, I'm going to start us off with round one, and then we will come back to address our various perspectives with round two. Around here, and my panelists can uh, walk off stage here, and I will go um, first. All right, and then um, after uh, we do our first round, we will have round two, and uh, we'll have time for some questions. And at that time, if you uh, if you have a question, I'm going to ask you to. Uh, perhaps address a particular panelist with your um, with your question. So here we go. I'm Dr. Valerie Hill, and I serve as the director of the Community Virtual Library. And uh, we have a main branch library in the virtual world of Second Life. And my goal of envisioning the library of the future beyond physical walls has included 15 years of utilizing virtual environments. My panelists, we're all going to share our perspectives on comparing virtual worlds as we hand off the mic. For me, before I got my own Oculus VR headset, I spent a couple of years attending demos where VR developers shared their ideas and their work. Early on, most of the demos were for gaming. And I will have to tell you that I uh, spent a lot of time uh, slaying some zombies. <laughs> I found very few VR applications uh, during those demos for education. And one developer assured me that he was working on educational use. But that turned out that that educational use was only showing students how to build in VR, not actually using VR to teach or to learn subject content. Now, today, of course, that's changing as VR becomes available to the mainstream population. And of course, all of us understand that VR can be used for many purposes, some educational, some just for fun. We believe that having a clear purpose is essential for educators in VR. So if you look at the photo on the right, um, it's a photo sharing um, uh, an adventure of uh, the one on the left is me slaying zombies, but you'll see the one on the right shares an adventure falling down the rabbit hole in a desktop immersive experience, Alice in Wonderland. And this experience took place in Third Rock. This is just one of many experiences, but several of us here today at this panel were there at that event um, entering a book virtually. And in this virtual world desktop platform, Anyone and everyone can collaborate and contribute the content. And that's not the same. It's unlike some VR platforms which require learning Unity or Blender to develop the content to be imported into a VR space. So desktop worlds like Second Life, where we have our library, or Kitely, they allow us to use voice, text, share documents within the world, build collaboratively in real time. And we feel that's a huge advantage for learners and learning communities. For me personally, as a librarian and an educator, I'm currently finding that most of my headset experiences are what I call disposable. And by a disposable experience, I mean I visit and I feel fully immersed visually. But then, pop, I'm done and I don't need to return to that experience. For example, swimming with dolphins or walking by a giant dinosaur. Bethany on the panel here calls this the wow factor. Wow, I'm swimming with dolphins, but then, well, then what? I'm done. What did I really learn? 
Educators may take students on some of these disposable experiences and they may be of high value. But the ability to, to, to create a community space with community ownership, we currently believe holds more potential for learning. One way to think about the difference is this. Primarily headset VR worlds present environments in which the top priority is visual VR space. And headsets often sacrifice the sustainable collaborative building and the interface tools to get that full immersion and realism. However, primarily desktop virtual worlds like Second Life or Kitely or OpenSim, they present environments in which that top priority is immersion into engagement and interactivity. So those worlds have to sacrifice full immersion for sustainable collaborative building and built-in tools for the collaborative learning. So we think both headset and desktop can provide a dynamic, persistent place, sense of presence and, and place. But virtual worlds that allow that collaborative building and that personalization of space, that creates a sense of community and ownership. Um, I'll give you an example. I recently went to Sign Space on a trip to Glacier National Park. The creator shared his passionate excitement about this space because it was very personal to him. He had imported real photos of animals and places since he lives near that park in the physical world. But afterwards, I thought, I could have watched a beautiful YouTube video and perhaps had nearly that same experience. It was his personal building experience. That was what was intriguing. And educators who want to teach students how to do that, how to build great VR spaces, they could benefit from that field trip. But that is not the goal for many of us. Building is but one skill, and not everyone needs to spend time in that way in order to embrace virtual environments for learning. My personal goal is to continue exploring these environments with my colleagues while I maintain the community virtual library as a real library in a virtual world. Because we don't really know yet how these spaces are going to evolve. Marie is going to come up next, and she's going to tell us how all of us are working together to explore VR with her personal uh, perspective. Marie, I'll pass the mic to you. Hi. I am Marie Vans. Um, believe it or not, I'm one of the people that worked on that Omnicept at HP. I'm not doing it anymore, but I did have some, some, um, some experience in that. But also in this capacity, I am a, on the faculty of the uh, San Jose State University High School where I teach a course in um, designing educational experiences in VR. Um, I'm also part of the Virtual Center for Archives and Records Administration, which is a community of students in from the iSchool and, and faculty in um, the virtual world of Second Life, and we have an island there. But um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is our VR Exploders Club. And um, just to give you some context, about a year and a half ago, we ran a survey asking educators about the affordances of in VR world, social VR world, that are specific to their needs as educators. So after compiling the results, we found that there were approximately eight must-have functionalities needed for any social VR world to be good for delivering quality, quality educational experiences. We then started visiting different worlds as a group to see whether we could identify which, which um, social VR worlds address the criteria that we found. This has grown into the Exploders Club, where we visit one social VR world on the third Friday of every month at five o'clock Pacific. Along the way, we have, we have grown to approximately 35 people who have expressed an interest in exploring these worlds together. Together, we learn about how, whether or not the affordances that we believe educators need exist in these worlds, but also we have fun trying to teach each other how, how to use the different functionalities in those worlds. While not every person comes every time, we find that we, we can help each other to learn how to move around and how to navigate, do things like that. 
the user interfaces and the interactables because in 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 second life we have a lot of interactables and in in some of these uh, social vr worlds there's um they either behave differently or there they there isn't any interaction um so the so um anyone who is in the group who has had prior experience so it's kind of like the the socratic model where you know the 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 person who who has the most experience helps everybody else out. And then as we go along, we gain more experience and we can help newcomers. Um, that um, any, so anyway, so there is this, there's always someone in that group that has prior experience and that, that we can get on our feet and get going pretty quickly when we get into these you know, new worlds because every single one is different. And there, it's also a lot of fun when we try things and we end up really looking like newbies um, the most prominent um, emotional experience we have together is laughter we 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 have so much fun we believe that this is the key to learning and it helps us to motivate continuing the prod the project and finally i want to say that if you are interested in joining us you can friend me here by iming me with your email address or you can email me at the email address that will be on the last slide in this um, in this in this talk. Um, I I will add you to our email list, and then I will send out the uh, information on the platform we are visiting, along with instructions on how to get in and join us. And that's about all I wanted to say at this point. So I think um, I think Bethany is is next. So hi, everyone. Um, as an instructional designer in higher education, my perspective is informed by my experience with faculty training and development and specifically how that pertains to educational technologies and online teaching. And I continually circle back to reevaluate my experiences and my observations. And that includes my assertion uh, that desktop virtual worlds, I think, are a little bit overlooked. I think we've got to keep our definitions, our terms like immersive and VR fairly broad because I don't think there's ever going to be one ring to rule them all. Movies haven't replaced books and 3D movies haven't replaced 2D ones. Desktop VR, and by that I mean Second Life and OpenSim, is very immersive. Not headset immersive, but in terms of staying up all night gaming or building and forgetting to eat immersive. And I worry that we privilege the visual as a defining characteristic for what it means to be immersed, and that's an impoverished definition. Speaking of visual, though, accessibility has to be at the forefront for any educator in VR. It's, it's a matter of complying with the law. And we've already got equity gap issues with internet access and computers, never mind limitations for people with mobility or motion sickness or vision or any other kind of accessibility issue. It's just common sense that desktop environments are far more accessible for our students right now with no special equipment needed. Audio issues are, are common in every platform, so it stands to reason that if we're going to actually give serious thought to using these environments in education, the ability to easily use chat and that chat actually be persistent is not just a wish list, it's something we can't compromise on. And we can't do education if we can't reliably communicate in a really robust manner. I mean, isn't that truly essential? And in thinking of the word essential, I have to say from where I sit, most educational technology is vastly underutilized. Even after a year of pandemic teaching crisis, you know, it's a sad reality. There's a lot of people doing remote teaching that still don't use the learning management system to its full potential. And it's the single most essential educational technology anyone has for teaching right now. And in my field, we always have people wanting to adapt something new, convinced it's going to be a magic bullet. And institutions have invested a lot in all sorts of technology that, you know, gathers dust in a storage closet. So when people try and get me excited about something new, I have to be skeptical. It's literally my job to say stuff like this, you guys, to ask uncomfortable questions. You know, like when someone doesn't have specific and measurable learning objectives, I have to be that bad guy. I have to poke and prod people if they can't articulate how a learning activity is aligned or is not aligned with the goals of a course. And a few years ago, I saw a VR chamber 
a, a heart chamber kind of VR thing. And I, I don't know if it was the Stanford heart. It might have been. I was in an Oculus Rift and I played around with it for a little while. And I was listening to all the excitement and the, and the sales chatter and whatnot. But I went away thinking if I was asked to approve the funding, I would ask the instructor and I'd expect them to be able to explain to me exactly how seeing the heart all around in a 3D headset is more instructionally effective than with manipulating the heart as a 3D object on the computer where you can zoom in and out, change the parameters like blood flow and blood volume and whatnot. We don't just use technology because we have it. We have to start with the learning objectives and find the content and modalities that best serve them. So it's imperative to be able to articulate in what specific way is this VR modality superior to the alternatives? Now, if you're teaching ocean ecology and your learning objective specifies increasing a student's level of commitment or their perception of urgency relating to coral bleaching, yeah, VR is gonna have an emotional impact that blows the doors off of just looking at pictures. I get it. I can certainly see a bright future in VR for trauma and healing and sensitivity training, all kinds of applications. But I also see a lot of useful features that enable us to have very productive learning experiences in desktop virtual worlds. And despite a global pandemic and all the talk about Zoom fatigue and concerns for students' mental health and their isolation and what desktop virtual worlds have offered us for decades, for the most part, they're gathering dust in the storage closet. And honestly, I don't think it's for a very good reason. They're just not the latest shiny gizmo that's getting the most hype. So that's it for me, I think. I'm gonna just go ahead and hand off the mic to Eileen. And thank you everybody. And I'm Dr. Eileen O'Connor. And I'm enjoying everybody's application here, but I'll give you a little history. Um, I work in a 100% online environment and I'm in a graduate program. So as a result, my students are dispersed. <clears throat> Generally, I am in New York State. I work for the State University of New York. And my students come in from around New York State, but not solely. They can come in from any part of the world. And that's been the case for the past 15 years. Now, my particular content area is more of science. I'm, I'm the STEM person. I was a chemist, then I worked for IBM for 10 years, and then migrated over to education. So I, I bring in the STEM background. And I began to see how these environments could help. So what I did was initially started in Second Life. And on my poster, you're going to see just some screen captures I took of events. And listening to my fellow speakers, I'm, I'm thinking too, I've emphasized one aspect, but there are more aspects than this. What my students do is they come in, this is an adjunct to my class. It, the, space that we meet in periodically is something that I use to build community. And I have teachers, educators, I have healthcare developers who are developing emergency medical areas. We all come in and meet in this space. And so initially I started in Second Life. Second Life was wonderful. It got too pricey. We could not continue to maintain it. So I went over to what's called open source where the code's available in quotes for free, but you have to have a server to put it on. So what I've done for the past eight years is use Kitely from which I can get a server that costs for uh, $20 a month. I can have 40 avatars on it 24 seven and I have built environments. The nice thing about going open source is I can get preloaded environments that are available by artists who maybe have made them available for free or on the other end, I can develop them myself and, you know, from scratch. So I can work anything in between a preloaded, lovely environment or an empty one and something in between. I can take some of the preloads. I can take things off. I can put things on. So I've used these for classes. Uh, we have meetings. We have poster sessions. A lot of what you can do, I think, in the, in the all space VR as well. But as Bethany pointed out, you don't need a headset. It's accessible to anybody with an internet connection and a computer on which they can download a viewer. So it's accessible to everybody. And what it's done though, because it's so affordable now, I've had a number of students who take a particular class with me, they design their own environments. So almost half of my graduate students have made their own environments. 
and I think I have this in the slide, what you'll find is that they are adults coming in from teaching in many different ways, and some of them have developed art environments, some of them have developed science environments, it's up to them or their career interests. So the affordability has made it so that they can create their own spaces. And we've been using them since 2006, originally in Second Life, and then migrated over to open source. So I've got a rich repository. I have a lot of research that shows this really works. And I would like to invite you, as one of the others said, if you email us, uh, I'll get you on the list I have and invite you to some of our meetings as well. Um, there, all you need to do is download your viewer and we'd love to have you. So I think I will stop at that and turn the mic over. And thank you very much for listening. Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Pat Franks from the iSchool at SJSU. There are numerous opportunities for the use of VR in education, including delivering classes and group sessions in virtual spaces, as well as hosting guest speakers and activities in social worlds, as you well know, <clears throat> creating art, designing environments, and developing virtual narratives, and then sharing them through games and 3D exhibitions and gallery spaces, and designing and hosting performances on virtual stages in virtual worlds for music, dance, poetry, and more. But there are business uses as well that our students should be aware of, such as teaching healthcare workers how to treat specific illnesses, providing virtual tours to promote travel and tourism, providing training opportunities for those in the military and sports, <clears throat> and creating interactive experiences to promote products. Some VR experiences require the use of a headset. Others allow the use of either a headset or a desktop like Altspace. However, effective use cases for 2D remain as well. Let's consider a few examples. Virtual world activities still have value. Allowing students to test mastery of subject matter by playing games such as separate or teaching them how to modify a cruise ship following COVID guidelines during a pandemic. But next, we should consider VR platforms that can be experienced with either a headset or a desktop application. Three examples shown on this slide are building and creating the Burning Man exhibit Insomnium Space, participating in a virtual tour of Glacier National Park in Science Space, participating uh, in virtual conferences in Verbella. The last is the commercial application of VR, where experiences are designed around a specific use case. For example, Lowe's HoloRoom How To can be accessed solely with a VR headset in one of 19 Lowe's stores across the country. As you can see, a hand control is being used to learn how to conduct a home repair project. A virtual catwalk was broadcast live in a virtual world created by 3D agency Initian at the retailer's Oxford Circus Store for viewing by prospective customers using Oculus Rift headsets. And VR is used in healthcare for pain management, shown here in use by a trauma patient. In 1995, Gartner had already placed virtual reality in the trial of disillusionment on its emerging technology hype cycle. By 2018, VR had finally climbed its way up to the slope of enlightenment and was expected to soon reach the plateau of productivity. But instead, VR disappeared completely. So although new to us, perhaps, it is now considered a mature technology. One estimate predicts that there will be at least 50 million headsets in operation by 2025. Because headsets will be more affordable, many of them will be used by VR novices around the globe. If you've ever used a headset, you'll know there is much room for improvement in the area of comfort and ease of use. That leads me to believe we still have three viable options to consider depending on our goals and available resources. 
VR headsets, VR desktop applications, and yes, even at times, 2D environments in virtual worlds. And now our next presenter will share some lessons learned from our exploration in his remarks on hybrid tech. Sidearm. Ladies and gentlemen, good day and greetings from Texas. My name is James Neville and my avatar is Sidearm. My topic for today's panel is hybrid tech. Each virtual environment option has its own set of strengths and weaknesses. The platforms that match your use cases best matter the most. Yet no one virtual environment can do it all. How can we choose from the hundreds of options now available? You will need to learn to use more than one. This is called hybrid tech using two or more applications at the same time to balance their strengths and mediate their weaknesses to best meet your needs. My slide shows two example images of hybrid tech, one using virtual headset and one using virtual desktop. The top right image shows helicopter pilot training certification using VR headset plus motion platform. The pilot sitting in the helicopter simulator is the head of the European Union Aviation Safety Agency, which just this year approved VR headset pilot training hours to count towards commercial training. This use case has real world economic and life and death impact. Piloting a helicopter is complex and dangerous and an extremely physical and visual experience. The VR headset convinces your brain and the motion platform convinces your body that you are there. If you've been to a Disney Park Star Wars ride, you know exactly what this man is experiencing. And if you've ridden in a helicopter or airplane, you know how reassuring it is that all commercial pilots must pass air safety certification. The bottom right image shows enriched air diver certification training using VR desktop plus custom scripting. The two avatars are a guide from the Professional Association of Diving Instructors and her student. They are navigating an underwater virtual environment while talking live over voice chat. The most important feature on their screens is the dial at top right, which shows how many minutes they have left before they must return to the surface and how many minutes they must wait at pre-specified depths to avoid the bends. This use case also has real world economic and life and death impact. Deep water diving is as complex and dangerous for aquanauts and clients as flying for pilots and passengers. The next time you explore underwater reefs, you'll be glad to know your guide is diving safety certified. In these examples, combinations of two or more tools were selected and customized to best fit use case needs. This is hybrid tech. Each of us here today have priority use cases in mind, and each of us are faced with picking tool sets to learn to make work for us. We are spoiled for choice. How can we possibly make a decision? Use more than one. Pick a starting virtual environment to learn and make it work. Acknowledge that your choice will evolve and change. Keep moving forward, applying what you're learning to what you need. Don't hesitate to change your mind and drop one thing to try another. Keep a short list of things to try and update it as you advance. There's one other issue. The platforms are changing rapidly, 
even the oldest and most stable, as platform developers scramble to keep up with technology and we users scramble to keep up with platforms. How do we handle that? Remember, you're not alone. Keep finding others who are working on similar use cases or with similar tool sets and compare notes. Keep moving forward, gaining confidence and perspective. In my own work, I have been finding what I call lines of demarcation that help me continue sorting the hundreds of options down to tens. But that is a topic for another day. If I might leave you with two key thoughts, they are use more than one and remember you're not alone. Thank you. Thank you, panelists. I'm going to ask my panelists now to all come down into the pit so we can um, go for round two. And in round two, we're going to um, consider you know, what all we've we've said here and uh, kind of uh, talk about our uh, perspectives and our different VR positions. And, and I'll go first. I just want to mention I totally agree with Bethany's comment on not always needing that visual immersion as the top priority. And I mentioned I need all those other tools. I don't want my hands tied behind my back. Uh, I want chat and links and back channeling and building and personalization. But that brings me to think that, you know, we've talked many times about how VR is bringing tons of interest for educators. But a lot of people don't realize that virtual worlds have already been successfully doing this for a long time. When Eileen mentioned the advantages she finds in the open source code worlds, um, those benefits and advantages um, are really worth exploring. And I totally agree with Sidearm. We have to explore more than one. And that term hybrid tech, we've got to juggle all of that. And um, when Marie um, talked about her the Explorer Club, we're doing that together. I totally agree, Sidearm, we're not alone. We have to go and explore these things and the best way to do it is together. So Marie, what are your thoughts? Okay, so what struck me was what Bethany was talking about on accessibility and, and as we're going to these different platforms, we always figure out that there's something that, um, that would really benefit from having some accessibility thought put into it. And um, I, it, it's, it's one of those areas where I know there is work being done, for example, by Donna Davis at the University of Oregon on helping to make VR more accessible. But what I, but what I find is, um, I, I find that, that, that there's, it, and there is another, um, conference called XR Access, I think, where they where the whole um, point of it is to, to look at and see what people are doing in this area. But I feel like it's something that that we need to, you know, shine a spotlight on. Because um, virtual worlds, we've been doing accessibility for 15 years, I feel like the people in that the, that are, you know, just starting out in VR could learn a lot from from what um, people have done in virtual world. So, so yeah, and, and, and it's, and it's something I feel really strongly about because I think it's an area we can bridge the gap between the virtual worlds and, and VR. Um, what, what, what are your thoughts, Sidearm? Yikes, my thoughts. I'm just going to say uh, what, what highlighted my attention. Um, I love how Marie invited you all to the VR Exploders Club. My understanding it was used to be called the VR Explorers Club. And after a few meetings, um, let me just say that they're very fun and it's much more fun exploring a strange environment with a group. But my favorite memory, no matter how official Marie is working on HP and all that, is her shooting me with rubber tipped arrows in rec room. I don't know why she does that, but it just made me fall over laughing and not complain so much about what an unfamiliar interface. I'm not used to it. Wah, wah. And after about the third expedition with the VR Exploders, I gave up the right to, to complain about any interface because it taught me that 
everybody that comes into the world I'm interested in it just has the same experience. The second thing that caught my attention is um, Bethany. Bethany said, it's my job, guys, to, to hold your feet to the fire, not your feet, but her, her faculty. If These are cool worlds, but purpose trumps coolness when push comes to shove. And if we're going to invest time and learning and money um, uh, and we're accountable to people, students or, or bosses, uh, it's got to it's got to it's got to fit the use case and i guess my last point was pat made the point that uh 50 million headsets and counting by 2025 so um <laughs> full disclosure i don't have a vr headset yet it's it's on my wish list now um and um but now i lust for a five thousand dollar headset not a four hundred dollar headset so you know we'll see where that goes so um, I'm turning it over to whoever is next on the road. Over. Eileen, we want to hear from you. What I've noticed in common to all of us is we're aggregators. We take technologies, we take uses, we take applications, and we bridge a number of areas. So I'm an instructor who brings people in. They have different needs. So I pull together a lot of what I've been hearing here um, but the one thing that I think we do in common is that onboarding. And I will tell you, it was so nice to meet a group that really, open quote, gets it. And what we look in education, there's something, that, a distinction that goes back to 2001, Mark Prensky, um, digital natives versus digital immigrants. So we, today, the younger folks coming in are already comfortable in environments that some of older folks like me needed to learn. So there's that onboarding piece. And I think the Exploders Club is great in that it gives all of us a chance to go someplace, learn a new interface where we don't have to be the professionals. We can be there, we can have fun, we can help each other. So I just wanna encourage everybody to join some of these groups. We, we really would love to have you come with us, not because you're perfect, but because we're all learning how to use these. We're seeing many possible applications. It's always exciting to hear what other people are doing. I wanna do it myself. More often though, I'm bringing others through, helping them. And with my students, I require they do a holistic thing. They don't just use the technology. They have to do is what Sidearm was saying. They have to show a hybrid application. There's never one technology that you need. You know, even if you have a great virtual world, you might need a website to help people in. So um, I just wanna thank, all of my colleagues here. And I think we are modeling the way we learn today in these plethora of new environments. So I'm not sure who hasn't spoken. We'll hear Pat on your reflections on what we've been talking about so far. So to be very truthful, I have tried headsets and uh, Oculus Rift S and I find it uh, something that I could use for an hour or so. It seems to be heavy on my head. It's easy to get tangled up in the uh, cord when I'm tethered to the machine. And uh, it's not always something that I think I could spend hours on. Uh, so I'm looking like sidearm maybe for a $5,000 set that might be a little more comfortable. I I think what we need there is something more for comfort and usability, something that feels more a natural part. Uh, and maybe when we get to the point where all we're doing is putting on special glasses uh, with little, you know, earphones uh, at the end of them, uh, it'll be a little easier for us. But uh, I too uh, started back in 2007 in Second Life. And so I know the learning curve was horrible at that time. It was as bad as we are going through now with virtual reality, some of us. And uh, it's worth the effort to attempt to get used to it. What I find is that there are so many options that um, we can't really be experts in all, nor do I want to spend my time in all of them. Uh, so what Sidearm said uh, is that we need to consider the purpose, right? Why are we do, doing this? Who is the audience for this? What kind of resources do we have available? And as I'm from in business, when I look at all the educational 
uses, that's wonderful. But education is one industry, only one industry, not 50 million headsets are going to be tuned to education. Uh, what we're also needing to do, I think, is understand all of the applications outside of our area, outside of education, so that we can make our students aware of the employment opportunities in the future if they become comfortable, maybe not as a developer or a builder, but uh, I run into so many consultants in this area for training and education uh, and that are very uh, versed in how they might apply it to different industries. And I think we have to bring that practicality back in there. And just one, one thought before I leave, uh, Bethany had talked about, can you justify the cost? And being from business, that's something I think of too. Uh, how much will this cost? What is the experience? What do we get out of it? Uh, how do we sell this uh, to our um, people that are in charge of our funding? Uh, can we make a good use case for what we're trying to do ourselves? Uh, I think there is uh, wonderful opportunities. I'm really excited about it, but I think we have to be very careful in planning for what we're going to do with the resources we have available. And I don't think we've heard from Bethany yet. Um, thanks, Pat. Yeah, I, I uh, want to just reiterate some of what you guys said, which is um, I, I talk a lot about purposeful tinkering, and I describe this all the stuff that we do in virtual environments as Burning Man in cyberspace, uh, because we do crowdsource the efforts to learn from one another. And I think that that's probably the best thing that we have to deal with exponential change and the volume of change and technologies that are coming at us. Um, Val often talks about how we can't reinvent the wheel. We can't. Um, and so it's, it's critical, it's imperative that we, we work together and not work in our little isolated silos. We, we've done that forever in, in the field of education. We tend to, you know, not get outside of our own institutions or we get attached to one particular platform and never never meet the tons of people that are out there have been doing stuff in virtual environments uh, in another virtual environment. So I would encourage people to adopt the um, the hybrid kind of model that site was talking about the collaborative aspect. I mean, that's how I met everybody here. Um, I, I met everybody on this stage. And the reason I'm even here is because I went to an open sim community conference and, and, um, and met Val and, and then Eileen, I met you at some other conference. I don't remember which was, but these were all desktop environments. And I have to say, I sound, I sound people often think that I'm like, you know, not enthusiastic about VR. I have an Oculus Rift. I love it. And I love seeing something that I've built from the ground up, like M Mozilla Hubs is my favorite VR platform at the moment, but building something that I've made and putting on a VR headset or showing it to somebody like, I built this. I'm very excited about VR, but I'm disappointed at how many people I think are passionate about this industry and the, and the applications who, who won't come into Second Life, won't come to a virtual world's best practices in education. And those have been going on for 15 years. I'm like, there's some, there's some amazing things that are being done. And I think there's, I, I just think that it's important to circle back, like um, has been said here before, we have to kind of come back to what we've done and reflect. And that's kind of a teaching thing too, right? We circle back and reflect and reevaluate. So I would say my final thought is it's, it's, it's past time for us to look back at desktop virtual worlds with kind of a new eye and say, ah, oh, what can I do with this now? Wonderful, Bethany, thank you. And I too agree with you that I just want to sound like I'm not enthusiastic about my VR headset, which I, I do have one. I'm lucky enough to have my VR headset. But um, I think we have to really think about all these different worlds and the best purposes we've talked about. One thing we didn't mention, too, is we're all exploring and researching in VR, but research really needs to be conducted in the future on the impact of the headset on our human brain, especially developing children, the brain of a, of a young child. And, you know, that they're so new, we don't yet know. So that's one concern that we really need to keep in the forefront. And also in these uh, different environments, pooling our resources and being together, as they've all said, we have done so much learning together. And uh, we do have a virtual world education consortium in the virtual world of Second Life, where educators meet quarterly to talk about their successes 
and overcoming their obstacles. Yes, yes, we'll stay a little bit longer, but I do want to thank you all for being here. And we wish you well on your journey in virtual environments for learning. And um, when you work in uh, VR headsets or on a VR desktop, we hope that you will make room for both. And you'll remember that you're not alone. Thanks so much.